uh, get you started. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to everybody for for tuning in tonight. And we have as a presenter, uh, Dr. Daryl Jones. He's an extension professor um, in the areas of uh, natural resources, wildlife economics, and enterprises. And he's going to be talking to us about recreational leases. And the way this came about is I had uh, was speaking with one of my landowners who was looking into some uh, hunting leases and uh, was looking for some extension resources. And uh, his publication was the, the best one uh, that I could, uh, uh, that, I, that, that was really relevant to a lot of our landowners in this part of the world. Uh, and he was from Mississippi State uh, University Extension. So, uh, so I reached out to him, he was more than happy to come and speak. So, uh, so Daryl, appreciate it very much. And uh, I'm gonna put a link to that publication in the chat box for you all to, to take a look at while he's presenting. So uh, turn it over to you. Phil, thanks so much. And Chad and Jeremy, appreciate being with you guys. And um, as Phil said, um, I'm an extension professor, wildlife professor. I was telling you probably more than you want to know about me. Um, I guess, Phil, I'll say it this way. Every, every little boy wants to be like his daddy. And my daddy was a banker. So I was a banker for about seven years and, um, and then decided to go back, was trained in agriculture, went back to school, uh, did some, some work at Virginia at Old Dominion, worked in Washington, D.C., one of the federal agencies, and then came back to Mississippi and did coastal management, was a state coastal zone manager. And then from that, gravitated back to the university where I uh, try to use the my wildlife training and also mixed in with that kind of the banking background, economics, finance, some of that to, to help landowners look at options on management of their land using outdoor recreation as an incentive. And, and some, and, and as we extension guys were talking beforehand for, for the audience members, we with extension and i'm be real quick to tell you this i'm not here to try to talk you into anything or to sell you anything just hopefully this this information will provide uh some insights on looking at recreational leases to see if that fits in with the landowner objectives that you may have and kind of my old bank blood talking if i talk you out of a bad decision that's a win that's a win too so if, if i talk I, when I talk people out of doing something that I think might not work for their property, uh, I feel good about as good about that as, as helping someone to us to uh, do a natural resource enterprise. So the, the the hunting lease is kind of part of my program here at Mississippi State with Extension Service. Um, and I named it. It's kind of hard to find a name that fits all this stuff, but uh, I call it natural resource enterprises. And what I deal with is helping landowners look at outdoor recreation on their privately owned lands to have paying clients or guests come on the property to recreate, enjoy the property. And, and that, that's a good thing. That's good public policy, uh, in my opinion. It also helps incentivize conservation, if you will, helps landowners make more money on their property um, and that, that's a good thing too. So some of these businesses that I kind of deal with, we're going to drill down a little bit later and talk about hunting leases more in greater detail. Um, but it deals with some other things. I'll kind of hit it broad brush first and then we'll kind of get more specific on hunting leases in a minute. But setting up businesses related to uh, recreational hunting. So that can be hunting outfitting kind of businesses where you're selling hunting excursions. Um, Hunting leases would be part of that. And to get to the chase on that, some of the survey work I've done with good folks like y'all that participate in some of these events, many of them in Mississippi and the Southeast and other places, uh, hunting leases and hunting operations, excursions are one of the most popular things they're kind of interested in. And that would kind of stand to reason because um, they're interested in improving the habitat, and land quality of the property and the hunting is kind of part of that, having a wildlife, diverse wildlife species and game species on their property. Also deal with uh, fee angling or fishing opportunities with leasing for fishing, uh, day trips, 
um, uh, permit type arrangements or these clubs where people, you know, landowner will have a larger lake and he sells memberships or she does into the fishing opportunities for the lake, have actually had workshops on properties like that. So that's, that's another option that's quite successful and real popular here in, in Mississippi with freshwater fishing. Of course, we, uh, as Virginia, we share, uh, we have a coastline on our Gulf Coast. So we, saltwater fishing is on public waters is a big deal and estuary is a big deal too. Do a little of that. Watching a wildlife or kind of ecotourism, nature-based tourism, uh, that is gaining ground all over the world, been doing it for a long time. Uh, lots of that is done on public lands, but also private lands as well. Um, and landowners I work with that have done hunting operations also do wildlife watching in the off season when they're not hunting on that same land on that same ground. So got some numbers to show you on that horse trail riding. Agritourism continues worldwide to be uh, something popular. Kentucky and uh, Virginia are steeped in that as we are here in Mississippi and around um, really the country. Um, just some ideas coming as I'm thinking through this have worked some in the, in the Western states with uh, beef cattle producers that do kind of dude ranching or agritourism on their properties uh, to show people how livestock is raised and the conservation practices they're doing with wildlife. So again, that kind of helps help that beef cattleman make ends meet beef prices are down, that agritourism, recreational um, opportunities on their property, if they're interested in that, is something that really helps make ends meet. And then bed and breakfast opportunities are having rural accommodations. You know, uh, I'll pick on Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so unless Phil, unless Tecumseh and Sherman comes back anytime soon, Atlanta's just gonna swallow us all alive. It just keeps growing west. Um, and, and that can be a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, but, uh, folks that live in, in, you know, the, the urban areas, Washington, DC, Louisville, uh, Atlanta, Birmingham on a Friday afternoon, they want to get out of town. So they're trying to get out rural accommodations. So landowners are interested in talking about the properties and offer, uh, some rural accommodations. This is something that's quite popular. I know we've got landowners on our Gulf coast in Mississippi that, do that quite a bit with birding tours and rural accommodations, these B&Bs on, uh, on coastal land. So lots of options here that, that a landowner can think about if he or she is interested in that. So what kind of money we're talking about, and, and you guys and ladies have probably seen some of these numbers. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with the U.S. Department of Interior about every five years, they do a survey to look at what dollars are spent by citizens in the U.S. to recreate outdoors. And what that drills down is primarily hunting, fishing, and watching of wildlife. So you see these numbers here. So the last survey, people that answered the survey that participate in, uh, and they, they ramped up the numbers to, to see what their, uh, what their overall participant list is, but about over a hundred million participate in the U.S. And those numbers seem to track up every time they do the survey. In addition to numbers of people, expenditures seem to increase every five years as well. So you can see the last, last DOI survey about 157 billion with a B is spent annually by people like us that recreate outdoors. And that's all recreational public lands, waters, and private lands waters, but a lot of that is geared toward rural economies uh, in Kentucky and Virginia and Mississippi and other, other good places. So you can see they are hunting about 26 billion. Uh, hunting numbers nationwide have been on a slide of late in recent years. In the Southeast, I would say, or South, those numbers have been fairly consistent. I think hunting like in Mississippi, I can speak to, is a, is a family tradition. People still do it quite assertively here. So we haven't seen our numbers slide, but nationwide they've been on the, on the down track somewhat. Angling continues to increase. So almost 50 billion spent annually. Wildlife watching 76 billion. So people to go bird, go see pretty watersheds and look at wildlife and, and 
camp and hike and bike and all the, the wildlife watching it continues to increase worldwide and in the nation as well. So what I did here, and this is kind of numbers, you always have to watch an economist and I'm not trained as an economist, but they'll pull numbers out of a hat and I kind of deal with these. But back in way back, back in 2006, this survey done by the Department of Interior, they had it by state and they changed that. I wish they hadn't, but I went back there back in 06, so what, 15, 16 years ago now, and pulled Kentucky and Virginia numbers and added them together. And then I just inflated it to 2020 numbers. So for, we're talking to Kentucky, Virginia, at two states together here, fishing about two billion spent, hunting almost a little over a billion spent, and wildlife watching 1.5, it's about 5 billion spent by almost 3 million outdoor recreationalists. So, um, you know, nothing to sneeze at. And again, these numbers seem to jack up and ramp up or step, stair stepping up, it seems like every, every year that they do the survey. Comparison, just thought this for, just thought it'd be interesting. I had this slide pulled together. For Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, those are, the, those are the same numbers. So quite similar just to Kentucky and Virginia as far as the magnitude of the numbers, but seeing fishing almost 2 billion spent by 2 million anglers, about a million hunters spending almost 2 billion. Uh, wildlife watching, a little over 2 million participants spending about a billion. So again, not on uh, nickels and dimes, it actually ramp, it, it ramps up pretty good. Now, this, is, this isn't apples to oranges. I'll just, what I did here is I took Mississippi numbers and ran them through a kind of an economics model, an econometrics model to see what the economic impact to the state of Mississippi is. Mississippi being smaller as far as um, land mass per se and also population base. We're mostly agrarian here, as y'all might know. Uh, and about two thirds of our state now is uh, forested. So, so acreage and timber and forest land is increasing, um, but agriculture still kind of holding its own as well. So I say that we have a lot of good rural land base that supports uh, wildlife recreation, hunting, fishing and whatnot. So these are economic impact numbers for the state. So all that to say the punchline, almost 3 billion annually in economic impact to Mississippi. Phil, I've showed these numbers to our legislators in Mississippi and they said, are you kidding me? It's that much money? And I said, yeah, when you actually look at the numbers, uh, it means a lot. We'll give the family farm a way to get Toyota plants to come here. And I don't mean that, I'm an old ex banker. I, it's a good thing to do that. But we'll, you, have, you gotta give them fresh water and land and, and cut taxes and everything else. But this is going on, I guess, under the radar being a wildlife guy. This is going on somewhat under the radar. So about three billion a year to the state. That's uh, that's good stuff. So uh, again, that's happening in Kentucky and Virginia too. I think it gives us incentive to do the right thing. We extension folks and helping landowners protect their land and increase the value of the land. So let's talk about some NRE stuff, kind of in general, just to kind of hit the tops of the trees here, and then I'll. Uh, kind of step down and we'll talk a little bit more about some of my comments about hunting leases. Fee fishing continues to increase in demand. This can be done from what I've seen uh, very commonly can be done along with hunting leases and fee hunting if you have uh, impoundments on the property. So it, it goes hand in glove together. And for you landowners with us, if you are uh, interested in this and or just want to increase the value of your uh, of the fishery resource fish fish resources in your ponds and lakes on your property, we with Extension Service have specialists that can help you with this. So I'm just telling you that to say you don't have to pay a consultant. You can, but you've got real good talent right there under your nose with uh, with Extension Service that can help you manage your lakes for uh, increasing recreational value in fish populations in your, uh, in your lakes and, and streams and, and ponds on your property. So keep that in mind. Uh, landowners who offer accommodations and rent boats, sell bait, they, the numbers go up as far as pricing. 
and and we're a land a lot of landowners that, that do this very thing one landowner comes in to mind give you an Al south alabama example did a workshop some years ago i'm going somewhere with this back to the fishing he was uh, actually a farmer and it kind of lost his pants, so to speak, in farming and was about to be foreclosed on, even on taxes, and was gonna lose the property. And he decided to go more this NRE approach with hunting. And he does whitetail deer hunting and does guided hunts and does a lot of intensive management of his deer herd. But also with fishing, he had about a hundred acres or so that he improved on his impoundments. Um, for for largemouth bass, he had some smaller ponds adjacent that he would grow out for forage fish, prey, prey fish with bluegill, uh, sunfish, and he would, I remember him flushing those smaller prey fish into those ponds and it would grow really large bass. He didn't even advertise any, any he had fishermen in there all the time that would stay in his lodges and would fish and then they'd turkey hunt and deer hunt in the fall and he was doing really really well and brought the farm back online so uh trey montgomery at level woods was his is his name but anyway he's a good example i think of the of the fishing that can be done um, on the property this is one you never a profit in your own land y'all as you well know this guy in the center here did a landowner in in southeast oregon and um, I worked in the past a lot with good friends at Farm American Farm Bureau. And I got uh, through Indiana Farm Bureau, met really good guy, Dennis Myram in Oregon, with the Oregon Farm Bureau, who I got linked up with this gentleman, John Hyde. He has a 5,000 acre cow-calf operation in Chilliquin, Oregon. And he's with the, uh, the Whole Foods Beef Conglomerate or co-op called Country Natural Beef. They are the the beef supplier for Whole Foods on the West Coast. And um, he's a, an extraordinary, extraordinary fishing guide and a fly fisherman, fly, ties flies, teaches fly fishing, this is him. So he has 5,000 acre cow-calf operation. Uh, and this little watershed is called Williamson River on his property. And he's done the things that you like to see. He's had alternative watering for his livestock. So they don't come to the creek, don't come to this small river. Uh, he's got a couple of cabins on the place and he runs it with his wife and his, um, um, their sons and his mother who recently passed away, unfortunately. Uh, Yamsey Ranch is the name of this property. But um, when we had a workshop there, when beef prices are down, he said the, the fly fishing keeps him on the property. He's booked from April into the end of October for rainbow trout and brook trout fishing in this river that comes through his ranch. So he's kind of a poster man that, of options that are available. Again, not, not for everybody, but um, it fits him really well and uh, he's doing quite successful with it. So again, just another example. I mentioned agritourism. Uh, in Mississippi, we've just some of the, the kind of metrics model, some of the surveys we've done about $150 million in impact to the state of Mississippi every year. Across the nation, it's one of the fastest growing tourism industries where people, again, want to get out of Atlanta, want to get the kids back on a rural family farm to see sunflowers or see how cotton is grown, to see how tobacco is grown in Virginia, whatever the case may be. Um, and and it's, it's quite popular. In, in the fall, yes. excuse me. Um, now, this is something I think that has helped here in, in Kentucky and Virginia had this as well, as well, agritourism limited liability laws. The state legislator, legislatures have kind of stepped to the plate and have, particularly with agritourism, have passed laws. If you're not familiar with it, look it up in Virginia, Kentucky, and your extension folks can help you with this, you landowners that are on the call tonight, on the webinar tonight. Uh, but these limited liability laws, legislatures have it where if you are registered with the state, and this is the, the short version of it, and you adhere to safety protocols and you get signage put on your place that Virginia and Kentucky, that Mississippi provides you to the State Department of Agriculture, you have some inherent um, protection against 
risk of people getting hurt on the property. That way, if I'm on the farm and a, and a bee stings me or I step in a stump hole, um, it gives some Kentucky or Mississippi or Virginia's, the state will step up and give some liability protection to me or to the operator as an agritourism operator in the state. So this has helped really with agritourism to kind of give some added protection. What I've seen in work, and I'm, I've got a slide, I'm gonna talk about this y'all in here in a minute, but the threat of being sued is the biggest deterrent that I think overall landowners have uh, with starting these kind of businesses and doing hunting leases as well. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Birding, the wildlife watching, as you saw from the earlier numbers, are continuing to grow. About a quarter of Americans say they participate, spending well to the tune over 30 billion a year. It's increasing in demand. We continue to see this across the nation. Uh, very compatible with hunting. Um, work with some West Texas landowners, particularly in West Texas, if you've got water, you've got wildlife, so to speak. So they'll have hunting operations and leasing on their, uh, on their ranch lands there. But when hunting season is over, of course, lots of birds, lots of uh, animals, wildlife come to that water uh, that they have on the property. So after hunting season, they switch over to, to birding and nature photography and use the same, same blinds that they were using in hunting. So these are some options for you. Well, so that again, kind of goes hand in glove. Um, another thing I tell landowners uh, that you can do in your native states, it works well here in Mississippi, uh, National Audubon, usually there's states that have a very um, active chapters and they are interested in birds in general, well, the well-being of all the bird species we have um, and migratory species that, and neotropical migrants that come through our states. Uh, and they'll work with landowners, not only on habitat management, but also identify what bird species they have, and that can help them with some of these birding opportunities. So Autobahn will work with a landowner. They see the benefit because they're increasing land available, good habitat for birds. So you can partner with people quite a bit. Um, another example, Phil, you'll have to ring me in like a loose bird dog. I start thinking of examples here. Uh, but one thing I'll just mention, um, a South Louisiana uh, example, work with a rice producer in South Louisiana. They have the yellow rail, uh, which is a migratory bird that birders really like to come see. Of course, all the wood storks and ibises and everything else we have in our uh, lower Mississippi River uh, floodplain, the Chapalaya River Basin uh, in Louisiana. This guy's a rice farmer. So he, he tells a story. I can't do it justice, but I'll make it short. He's running the combine and he's, he's got a turn road cutting rice and he, he turns the combine around. He notices all these people parked on the side of the road uh, of a state road and they're on the road bank looking out at the field. And of course he sees birds every day and not, doesn't think a whole lot about it uh, as much. And they're watching yellow rails and all the water birds in front of the combine, you know, feeding and moving and whatnot. And he gets out of the combine, he walks up to this group on the road and he says, uh, what are y'all doing? He says, oh, we're just watching the birds in front of your combine. Do you mind? He goes, no, I don't mind. You want to get in the combine with me? I said, yeah. So from that, they started the Yellow Rail Festival in South Louisiana, which is around Lake Charles. And they bring in hundreds of thousands of people annually in this. And it's an economic engine now. So here we got Audubon working with rice farmers. Who would think it? So the... Um, you know, odd bedfellows, but they've gotten together on birding and it's good for the, for the birds, it's good for the, the people community, the, the rural communities down there. Horseback riding, uh, quite popular. Four million horses are thereabouts. I own probably more than that now, own for pleasure. Um, we have a lot of riding. This is something out of my brain. Public land managers like National Forest, um, state wildlife management areas, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife National Refuges, their, they, their monies are kind of drying up. Of course, that's on the tax roll coffers, so they, uh, they don't get tons of money to manage those lands anyway. So hunting and fishing, those revenues bring a lot to it. Horse trail, right, they also have other, these other visitors as well. I've had landowners adjacent to these, these public lands will cooperate 
beneficially with the public land manager of say a wildlife refuge or national forest to offer horse trail riding where the, where the uh, horse folks will stay in lodging and hookups on the private land and then ride up not only in private land, but public land too. So they join forces with your public land manager. So landowners are very creative at, I think doing this. Uh, there are liability issues where horse people, horses can hurt you quick. Um, as y'all well, well know, um, one thing on liability probably, and people will offer the mounts, but I would typically tell my landowner folks to let them bring their own horses to ride and you just provide the access to them uh, on, the, on the land. But you can provide horses mounts as well. Some people do both like those Western ranchers with these dude ranches. Uh, ranching opportunities. Numbers I found on the internet, um, and I can't substantiate this, I'll, although I found it, horse trail riding in Minnesota, uh, about a $50 million a year annual annual income to the state. And I didn't know that about Minnesota. So you would think so, uh, you would think even some of these Western states would have, Texas would have more than that, for example. So again, helps bring people in. As y'all probably well know, um, shooting sports continues to be quite popular. This is just some numbers that I took nationally that I found about 20 million participate in shooting. I enjoy shooting, particularly clay targets, uh, shot, shot shell, sporting plays, that kind of thing. I train gun dogs as well for upland birds. But uh, on, um, on uh, rifles, pistols, including some archery, Lots of people participate spending um, 17 billion annually on equipment and travel. I think about 5 billion of that is in travel alone. So it's continuing to increase. And as a landowner, I wouldn't be probably first in line and wanting to put in a gun range on my property, but some like doing this a landowner in Indiana that we hosted one of these NRE events at. He did that and does quite well. Rural land in Indiana. It's uh, sporting clays, uh, uh, skeet, and trap. So uh, he, he does quite well with that. And of course, that goes in hand in glove with, with a shooting preserve and with upland game birds like ringneck pheasant and uh, bobwhite quail that come to mind. So again, that's, that's an option if people are, want to think about it. Some other things I think, particularly in the South and nation as well, but in the South particularly, of course, Virginia and Kentucky, part of that b, &B accommodations to get on rural land. Uh, it's beautiful. People want to do that, see that, want to talk to the landowner. Um, music is another thing. We in Mississippi, I think I can talk about us. Um, we take this for granted. With blues music, country music, Jimmy Rogers, Meridian, Mississippi, the singing brakeman. Um, Memphis likes to claim him, but Elvis Presley was from Tupelo, Mississippi, king of rock and roll. All that kind of stuff really brings people into rural areas in the state. And a lot of the music, I think some of that music was, was really, uh, was influenced by the rural nature of the state and those wild lands, so to speak. So it's all in the box, I guess what I'm saying. Culture with literature and history, uh, folks want to come worldwide to view that. Uh, in Kentucky, in Virginia, in Mississippi, that rural appeal and family tradition. So all that kind of goes in the box with, I don't think this is going anywhere. People like to get out and recharge their batteries. So uh, landowners that want to participate, there's opportunities here. So I say that to say this, I'm going to let you landowners out there, I want that sign kind of wash over you a little bit. Um, I like to show this sign it's kind of a joke at the landowner workshops. And, and invariably after I talk about it, uh, after the event, hey, really enjoyed your talk. I, I really want one of those signs. <laughs> this is what you can't do legally. Uh, Phil, I don't think I told you before you invited me. So he's gonna, he's gonna regret even inviting me after I tell these stories. Um, but uh, I get question, probably the number one question I get in Mississippi is what, can I lease my property for this? And I said, well, tell me about your property. And so we come up with kind of a price. What would you think the second question is? Most popular question I get. Can I shoot a trespasser? And you, you know what my answer is? Sure, you can shoot him. It's just not legal to shoot. 
Uh, this is the only thing you can't do legally uh, is shoot someone, a trespasser on your property. I get asked this all the time. So it's, it's a problem. People that own private lands like some of you do, people that inadvertently get on the property or intentionally trespass uh, is an issue. Let me take just a little time and talk about that. One of the things I get, and, and I'm not schooled as an attorney, so there's a little bit of a disclaimer here, and I don't know Kentucky or Virginia law, and I don't know Mississippi code A to Z, but um, I know it enough to kind of talk about this to the degree you can ask good questions of your state uh, folks and of your extension friends here. Um, if someone is trespassing on the property, they're not supposed to be there. So when I get asked a question, am I guilty if they trespass on the property and get hurt, am I going to get sued and lose the property? The short answer is no, because a trespasser has no legal basis for being there. So a landowner does not hoe him, him or her, a trespasser, a duty for their well-being or protection other than I can't willfully hurt them. So I, a, setting a spring gun or a pitfall trap, uh, I can't legally do that. But if a trespasser comes on my property in rural Winston County and is deer hunting, and I don't know he's there, and he falls out of my pine tree and breaks his neck, I'm not liable for that because he's not supposed to be there anyway. Now, that's not to say I won't get sued about it, but from, say, family that wants to collect money, but chances are there's no precedent that I will be uh, held accountable. So you have, uh, there's three types of people that can be, or classes of individuals. So a trespasser has no legal basis to be on your property. Uh, there's something called in Mississippi and probably true in Kentucky and, uh, and Virginia as well, a licensee. That's someone that I give permission to, to be on the property. Say, the neighbor's kids want to fish in my pond. So I said, sure, you can fish in the pond. Just be careful. Don't, don't fall off the levee and drown. You know, I may need to tell them of any of hazards I know, but I, as a landowner, I'm not gaining any benefit by them fishing in the pond. So if the kids do get hurt, I don't have any more duty to a licensee, somebody I'm giving permission to, as I would a trespasser. And then there's a, uh, a, a, a permittee or a client type individual. That's an invitee. Those are people that I'm charging. Now, I owe them a greater duty to. You know, when you go into Walmart and you go in the produce aisle and there's a, there's a sign saying the floors are wet because we spill grapes, they're warning you of a hazard. So I just need to do things as a landowner to protect people um, that, um, that I'm charging. So it's a step up in duty that I owe in a business invitee or permittee, what it's called invitee. So you don't owe a duty to a trespass. People that I deal with that have trespassing problems, I, my two bits on that is to post your property and let them know that where your landlines are. And if you're having problems, use your cell phone, take a picture of a car tag. It's hard to catch a, a, a trespasser. And think about this, if they're hunting, they're gonna have a gun. So keep your wits about you. And so I don't want to get up in the face of a trespasser per se, even though I may feel like I want to, but take a picture of the license plate, get with your local sheriff or your conservation officer, your game wardens and tell them about it. And if you sign an affidavit with your local sheriff, they have the permission to arrest them if they come back. And the other thing that does, you have set the tone that you don't want them out there and the penalties will escalate from there. So if you kind of start out like you can hold out, the word will get out that, you're, that you don't tolerate trespassing and sometimes that will clean itself up. But I have a lot of issues with landowners with this. So I have no doubt it happens in Kentucky and Virginia as well. Um, but um, we wanted to kind of talk about that. So now let me kind of drill down uh, a little bit with time here about a recreational hunting lease. As you would probably know, it's an arrangement un whereby a landowner, you would grant access to his or her land for recreational hunting for a designated time period for money. 
for, for fees. These are some things that I've seen landowners have done to make their leases more attractive. And, and another thing it does, not only does it make the lease more attractive, makes the land more valuable as well, your land. So maintain a well-defined access trail system for the person I'm leasing the property, those lessees can use to travel across the property. If they, um, if they harvest a white-tailed deer to go retrieve the, retrieve the animal, another thing that trail system does, it keeps people on the roads, keeps people on the trails, that way they're not running all over the property. So that's a benefit to your land there. Uh, I don't have to do this. A lot of lessees will do, people, the hunters will have their own stands but if I'm providing blinds and hunting stands from that orthodontist out of from Birmingham for him and his daughter, I'm gonna charge more for that to kind of have a turnkey type situation. If I'm putting in food plots, supplemental plantings for wildlife, I charge more for that. A lot of hunting clubs would do that themselves, that's fine. But if I'm doing that as a landowner, um, I'm gonna charge more for it. And that's the way you, 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 can, you can escalate what you're pricing per acre. Uh, having places they can camp or lodging is important. Some of the things providing, you know, just niceties at home, having a fire pit, firewood, go to place to the bathroom, clothesline, trash is an issue. I know in Mississippi we get most of our road trash when it blows out of back. So pickups. So uh, if I'm leasing land, places they can put trash up and I can help police that, uh, that's, that's something to do. Having a uh, uh, water that they can drink and use is also another nicety. These are things that landowners that I've worked with have done to increase their uh, the attractiveness of their lease. I'm a proponent of having a lease agreement. This is a contract. And if you kind of do this up front, it can help eliminate some problems down the road. And it's kind of, don't take this wrong, anybody, but you know, uh, sometimes marriages don't work out or, or deals don't work. You got to have a back door to get out of it. Hunting, a good contract will give you a back door that you can use to get out of a bad situation. Another reason to have a hunting lease. Uh, in, the, in the publication that Phil's going to share with, with y'all, I've got a, some example of a hunting lease at the back of it. I would say this, don't use a cookie cutter lease off the internet. If you're gonna do, thinking about a hunting lease, use what I'm providing, use what you find on the internet and fine tune it to fit your property. I think that's essential. Don't use just something carte blanche um, and sign it and go with that. Chances are you need to fine tune it. These are some of the things to think about, having who you're leasing it to, their names on there. Um, game species is hunted and viewed. Let me go back to the lessees. Timber companies, I know in Mississippi, probably true in Virginia and, and, um, and Kentucky as well, they don't lease to an unincorporated hunting club. They want them to be uh, incorporated. And our Mississippi Secretary of State on our state lands like 16th section school lands, they won't lease to an un unincorporated hunting club. So that makes the club incorporate so you're dealing with a legal entity if you as a landowner don't necessarily have to do that, but if you do that and you deal with me as ABC Daryl Jones Hunting Club, and I'm the president of that so-called hunting club and we have 10 members and I sign for the club and we're not incorporating, incorporated, you only have an agreement with me if I signed it. So if they're not incorporated, have them all sign the lease. But game species that you're hunting or that you're utilizing, have a legal description of the property attached to the lease that shows boundaries for those lessees to know where the property is, where the lines are. The dated terms of the lease is this for a year, for a hunting season, for five years. As a landowner, I was short starched on a short time period. And then if you get a real good lessee you really like, you could think about extending it with a clause in there, maybe to go up a little bit every year so you don't get blocked in on price. Payments and important, as y'all well know, I would get the payment up front or at least some type of deposit and get most of your payment collection for your lease before the hunting season. You wait till after the hunting season, you, chances are maybe something may happen that, you know, you hear things like, well, we didn't see the deer we were hoping to see and old Bill didn't join the club, so we don't have all your money to go. You don't wanna have to deal with that. You wanna get your payment up front 
if they're going to hurt, if they're going to hunt. Some other things, I won't read them all, but whether you allow subleasing or not, I would not uh, personally. Adhering to state game laws, if they break state game laws, that, that's a condition in the lease, and that's a reason for you to terminate the lease. Do I want a bunch of yahoos out there that are violators? No, you're going to have more problems with those. So you may have to weed through some bad eggs to get some good ones. But these are conditions you want to think about on the front end of your lease. Damage to your trees, types of stands that your blinds that are used, garbage removal, trespass. Here's a good one, accepting land as is. I'm making as a landowner no promises of the wild turkeys you'll soon in place or the deer herd. I think you've got, we've got a good deer herd, but I'm not making no promises. So you wanna make that known uh, kind of up front. So conditions are important to have in your lease. So let's talk about legal issues a little bit. Uh, reducing liability on the property. In Mississippi, I don't have to make my land legally safe in every regard. That's hard to do. But if I do what a reasonable person would do and what a prudent person to, uh, should do, that's the way it's listed in state code. So what that means to me, guys, is to reduce hazards on the property that I can reduce and those that I can't eliminate to tell my lessees these are the hazards out there. Got an old bridge on the back 40 I hadn't fixed yet, use it at your own risk. Or there's a mean bull back on the pond field, Ferdinand will run you through the fence. Let them know about Ferdinand, put that in the lease that they sign and they're aware of it. So that's being reasonable and prudent. So having these well-written leases get at that. Having attorneys review it, I think, are important or I can help you review that. We in Mississippi, I encourage the use of waivers it's how one would use a waiver, a liability waiver. I've had people tell me, hey, they're not worth the paper they're written on. I disagree. Um, but the way you use a waiver, let's say I've got Phil coming from Virginia to turkey hunt with me, let's say, and, and I have a, you know, I have a hunting out, outfit or excursion business. Get him up the morning, we're going to listen to a bird and hopefully gobble in Mississippi. And we're having coffee and right before I put Phil in the truck, I said, Phil, you know, I need you to sign this liability waiver before that, you know, just kind of helps me with my insurance. Um, I need you to sign that before we get in the truck and go hunt. What's he going to do? He's come from Virginia. He's probably going to need to sign it. Well, that well, judges don't look good on that. The way to have done that is before Phil came to me for the spring turkey season in Mississippi Back in October or July, I sent him a packet of information. And oh, by the way, Phil, I've got a liability waiver in there. I want you to come hunting with us, but sign that waiver. We're going to have a real safe, good hunt, hopefully. That's what we're planning on. But that's a way for me to keep my insurance costs reasonable and send that back to me. That's the way to have handled a waiver. Um, and so I encourage landowners in Mississippi to use them. Louisiana, they're not legal. So I say that, Phil, and... Uh, you guys, y'all check to make sure in the in the state there, Shad, whether they're legal or not in Kentucky and Virginia. Enforcing rules, insurance um, on, on leases, I encourage landowners to have their hunting group have insurance. Now they don't have insurance for them, but a landowner can, uh, can require in the lease that they have an insurance policy for them and name the landowner me as an additional insured party on their policy. And don't just take their word for it, get proof and certification that they've done that through the insurance company. That's additional insurance to help with liability issues of people getting hurt on the property. And then me as a landowner would have my own insurance. So hunting insurance for leases is reasonably priced. Insurance companies have been offering this for a while and last some of eight cents, 10 cents an acre. I mean, it's not out, it's not just out of the question, but I would say two million in insurance. I mean, you need to cover yourself just in case. And you know, I've had landowners say, well, you know, old Bill wouldn't sue me. It's not gonna be Bill that's gonna be suing you. If he got killed, it may be the spouse or the family member that now has to take care of the children. They'll be the one with their attorney this that's going to sue the landowner. So think about it that way. It's just better to have all that covered up front. We're gonna get short on time, but let me just mention business structure. This is an accounting or legal issue that, that needs to be thought about by a landowner. 
um, me as a sole proprietor or say Daryl Jones having land, if I lease to a group of hunters uh, and I get, if I'm, if I'm negligent and get someone killed or hurt, let's say on the property, and it goes to court and I'm found that I was negligent. That's the only way I would be liable or sued or, you know, pay a claim. Um, if I'm in my property, is just in Daryl Jones and all my property, my house, my life savings all on the line. But if I have a structure, a limited liability corporation, for example, and have my land, for example, in that, in that and I have a hunting lease LLC and I only rent the land from my land holding LLC and they, they, and I'm negligent and they sue me in the hunting lease LLC. They may get my truck or whatever's in that LLC. They won't get my life savings. They won't get the land because that, that hunting LLC lease LLC doesn't own the land. So structures can be used to, with your attorney to uh, protect yourself from business exposure and reduce risk. So again, just think about that. And I can, landowners out there on the call, I can kind of help you with, think about that. What can I charge? In Mississippi, this is what I found through some of my surveys I've done um, in the past um, five, I see anything from five to $65 an acre on, on land in the state, land that has better habitat, um, good, forest coverages with mixed pine hardwoods or bottomland hardwoods or sustainable timber production with good ag ground with wetlands adjacent and watershed. The, these will go for higher, higher uh, prop, property leases because of the good concentrations of game species on turkey, deer, squirrel, rabbits, my white quail. So in the $21 an acre on average is what we see in here. I put in 16th section land. These are school lands in Mississippi. Some of that ground has been high graded where they cut a lot of the timber on it. They're still leasing for seven to $12 an acre on average in the state. Now, some of those are real good tracks. Some have been high graded. So I only see prices kind of escalating a little bit with leases. Uh, so uh, I would at least price my lease, look, get my land taxes at least and look at other leases in the area. And then you can separate your hunting leases to whitetail deer or to turkey leases um, and have different lease structures that can, can kind of increase the, the value of your lease. Now, we're just, a, I'm going to rifle through these. A couple of years ago, I did a rural land study and Phil, I want to throw this in there to show you some what wildlife recreation means to the value of land, at least in Mississippi. I found it's almost a third of the value of the land here in Mississippi, in addition to ag ground, you know, what you make farming on it, what you cut timber on it, and commercial value. So a third of the value is due to wildlife related recreation. That's a good chunk. The types of property that really forested ag ground, uh, these two land cover types really drove some of that value and some of the survey work that I've done with banks like Federal Land Bank and Mossy Oak Properties to look, look at this. Won't have time to drill down tonight, but thought you might be interested that bottom end hardwoods in Mississippi and mixed pine hardwoods were the main predictors of what people want to buy land for in our state. And this was for hunting and for moving across the land to hunt. These were the game species that they were saying they were buying the property for. And of the about 800 properties in this survey with the Federal Land Bank, about 123 were leased, or 123 were leased. Uh, that ranged in acres from 12 to almost 2,300 acres. And that's where I got that mean lease price. These were better properties with older age class timber, managed right, had good wildlife habitat on it, about $21 an acre. So, um, you know, that, that's not bad. Roads on the property were important. 86% of them had roads, two and 30, 32 had percent of the properties had roads on the property. Some had lodging, those sold for higher prices. And again, about a third of the value of land, rural land in Mississippi was due to wildlife recreation. I, and I would be so bold to say that's gonna increase in time because they're not making any more land, as y'all rural land, as y'all well know. These are some practices that landowners do to increase revenues on their property, kind of hit some of those. Now, one thing, farm bill programs can help, practices can help, that the USDA can help landowners with do some of these 
these practices so the government can help you with cost share, but strip disking and mowing and so types of timber harvest are important, prescribed burning, all this thing, all, all these practices help. I won't go through, the, this is right around my house, Phil, and I just took some good wildlife uh, picture plants here to show you. So flower and dogwood, American beauty berry there with the, with the purple fruit, great for birds. Uh, Mayberry, which is a vaccinium up in that upper right. Wild turkeys love this. That picture in the grapevine there at the bottom growing up that hardwood tree um, is uh, wild grape. Turkeys love. They, woodpeckers come in there and feed, and I watch them all the time while I'm drinking coffee. Black cherry all the way over there on the left with the red leaves. Great forest, uh, uh, forest plant, a tree that wildlife species really depend on, particularly game species with uh, turkey, particularly love it. Um, narrowly sunflower uh, um, there on the, on the helianthus on the left, and on the bottom, uh, bullgrass or paspalum that, that uh, quail and turkey like. So you got a lot of this on the property, and with some of your help from extension folks, you can keep these these and encourage these plants and this will really help your wildlife and increase the value of your leases. I'm going to wrap up with this kind of point to you. This is a property I work with in north of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River. They do hunting excursions on about 9,000 acres of batcher land right there on the Mississippi River. So they're, they, it's, it's, uh, it's fee-based archery hunting and during particularly in the rut uh, whitetail deer, they, they have people booked from mostly the southeast, but very, very popular destination, producing really big deer, uh, very good hunting property, obviously. They also do other things with youth camps and conservation weekends and I do more with birding and whatnot. But I, they asked me to do a survey, and I'm going somewhere with this, stay with me, of their archery hunters. So of their archery hunters, this is one of the questions I asked, how important are the following things in this in this uh, in this question of influencing the quality of your hunting experience at Tara? These are bow hunters that are paying three and four thousand dollars for a weekend hunt. So if I'm paying that, I want to obviously harvest a nice deer. I hope. But notice the thing: these green bars, how they how they uh, those are very important items. Being with friends there in the middle of the graph that was important meeting new people, not so much, exploring and learning, communing with nature, reflecting on values. Those were even more than sharpening their hunting skills. Um, rest and relaxation was a big deal, that green histogram there. Escaping social pressures and physical pressure, getting away at the traffic out of Atlanta, getting away from people and the cell phone. So harvest was important, but it wasn't the biggest thing. So these are hunters saying this. So imagine what it would be if it was wildlife watchers. It would be skewed even more that, more this direction toward those intrinsic value of rural lands and just getting away to recharge the batteries and see wildlife. So, and as I've gotten older as a hunter, I enjoy watching wildlife as much as I do the harvest and getting kind of away from the harvest, to be honest with you. So if you lease the land, you get that, that good lessee, he or she's interested probably in that maybe taking an animal, harvesting an animal, but getting outside and enjoying being in nature is a big part of it as well. So with leasing, these are some of my bird dogs here, as you can see, and I love doing that, training gun dog. Hunter satisfaction is tied with the quality of that outdoor experience and that habitat and that quality land. They're drivers of that good experience. So it's, it's not always a harvest, it's seeing wildlife. Uh, having a limited number of hunters is something I'd be interested as a landowner, maybe just one or a couple. You're dealing with potential less problems with just having a few people out there and their, their experience will be greater because of that. Fair chase is what I deal with. Don't, don't do anything with really high fence operators because that's more of an animal husbandry issue and I'm a, more of a wildlife habitat manager, but fair chase hunting. And then the notion of being when in nature, I think is what a lot of people are looking for. So I guess the bottom line, guys and ladies, I'm thinking about value added benefits for you as a landowner. Leases and some of these other opportunities we talked about tonight can enhance income. It's shown to enhance conservation and make your land more 
more uh, profitable. I already sh showed that with that rural land study. We were kind of hit the peak of there a while ago. Enhances wildlife species. Landowners will tell me too, they're interested in potential for revenue, but I want to increase my wildlife populations on my property. So they're interested in that. And these, these enterprises, hunting leases can help you raise the money to do just that. Controlling access. Another thing I didn't mention to you, Phil, but half of the landowners that participate in my workshops in the past, or half of them are absentee landowners. They don't live on the property. So another thing, if they live in uh, Houston, Texas, for example, they own land in Mississippi, a hunting lease will put good lessees on that property while that landowner is actually in Houston, Texas and not looking at it every day. So additional eyes on the ground and can eliminate some of those trespass issues controlling access to the property. It's what the take home punch is there. And finally, it promotes uh, land stewardship, value of the property, and then helping landowners to retain that ownership of the property, which, you know, what's wrong with that? We need to do as much of that, in my opinion, as, as, as we can. So this is my contact information. If I can help you in any way um, with looking at any of these options, including not limited to it, hunting lease, give me a call. At, my email is there office cell phone number. And that last thing there is my website, www.naturalresources.msstate.edu. Go to that, got lots of gobs of good information on, on that. And Phil will share with you, uh, the landowner participants, that uh, publication, the hunting lease publication, I think you can use and hopefully that will help you as well. So with that, hope I didn't go too long and, and just completely uh, drain your energy, but I've enjoyed being with you and look forward to uh, having more contact with you later. And with that, Phil, if I can answer any questions, uh, let me put my name back up. Um, love, I've enjoyed being with you tonight. I've enjoyed it. Thank you lots. Great. Thank you. Uh, you had had somebody who just, uh, they said they had another Zoom meeting at seven, but they wanted to thank you for the information. Right. Uh, right. That was one of the landowners from Lee County, Virginia. Right. And, uh, I like, uh, I thought of something when you were talking about adding uh, value to the lease, like fire pits and trash cans. Uh, right. I, I met a beef producer from Western Kentucky back in the nineties. And he was talking about all the money they made on their farm from a, a hunting lease and what they right. would do. They had a bunkhouse for the leases to live in. And sometime during the course of the hunt, they would, uh, the landowners would dress up like cowboys and ride in and they, they would cook beans for the police <laughs> over the fire and, and just, uh, they just ate it up. They, they, they loved it. But what, what could be yeah. wrong with that? I, I, yeah. I might, I might drive to Virginia to see that. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's part, and that's part of and on the fire pit. If I mentioned y'all, the South Alabama guy, uh, Trey Montgomery, you know, he had a really big deer, um, real good Turkey population. Mm -hmm. Had these hundred eight. He was the one with a hundred acres of farm ponds that managed and pound a huge bass. You know, ten pound plus bass wasn't a big deal. Right. Um, and so he set me up, and I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, he said, "Why do you think they come here, Daryl? We were land on a workshop there." And I said, "My God, it's to you know see those turkeys strutting." He goes, "Well, yeah, that's part of it. Harvest that big buck. Well, yeah, that's part of it. Catch that twelve pound bass." And, and mount, you know, take a plaster Paris over and mount and get, have her mounted from my office. Well, yes, he says, they, but it, they come for the fire pit. Uh, they come and sit around the fire and drink their toddy or tea, whatever they like. Right. And hell, I have trouble getting them up in the morning. So, I mean, so that, and he doesn't even advertise. And DuPont Chemical comes and brings clients. They have just found this guy. And uh, he was the one that was gonna lose his farm, literally. They were going to auction it off and lose it. And he, he did this, but it, I thought that was kind of cool. He said, no, it's not that big deer. It's the fire pit. That's why they come. <laughs> yeah, I, I went uh, with Tennessee Farm Bureau one year, went on an agritourism tour and we, we yeah. visited a farm near Nashville. And that's what right. they said. They said on the farm, they had multiple fire pits and yeah. they would, on any given Friday evening, they would rent one fire pit to the Boy Scouts for 15 bucks, and they'd rent one fire pit to some youth group for 15 bucks, and they had multiple fire pits that they would, would rent out. And, and I wouldn't want to do this, but I did a workshop at one of these, and I know it's big time up there with y'all, but these um, kind of gets back to the bed and breakfast. 
these uh, venues for weddings. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a beef cattle farmer in South Mississippi and he's down on the coast. So you got a lot of people getting married, obviously down there, but his wife, they decided to put in a wedding barn and they are booked like for the next five years. And he's a beef cattle farmer. <laughs> I mean, you know, now I wouldn't want to deal with the mamas, but, but she can, you know, and uh, I mean, they're getting it's next to a lake and the beef, you know, the, the, the beef cattle on the, the Brahmas and the, and the heifers are over there and they having a wedding during the whole thing and drinking champagne, people eat that up. So, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, so how creative can you be? Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, guys, I've enjoyed it. Let's, uh, well, I like to stay in the saddle with you. Let's do one of these events kind of when oh, we get everybody over this COVID stuff and we all get vaccinated, maybe we can get together and, and uh, yeah, have we, a workshop. We, we got to have a reason to drink bourbon together, don't we? Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, we Darryl, love to have you over. Some, hey, Daryl, yeah. thanks so yes, much. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Terra Hunt Club. I hadn't thought about that place in years. You had? You know about it? Yeah. Uh, used to read a lot about that stuff. I mean, uh, great bow hunt location. It is. Uh, and they've <laughs> done a great job with management down there. At least, you know, I agree it's been years since I followed that. Yeah, that's right, Jerry. Gilbert Rose is the manager down there. He's a great guy. He's actually from Australia. So when you walk up to him and you're in rural uh, Mississippi Delta, and you got this this Australian guy with the Australian accent. He's cool, just cool as all can be. But uh, yeah, that's a neat, neat property. And uh, uh, but I thought that was kind of cool how these bow hunters are, are so interested, you know, just kind of getting away from everything. And and it's not always about like I was saying, y'all know I'm preaching the choir. It's not always about the kill, you know. So that's a good example of that. But that's a neat property. Yeah, definitely. Y'all come to me down here. Uh, if I can ever help you yeah, in the we'll, future, let's just stay. I'd like to stay up with you. Maybe we can do an event up your y'all's way sometime. If, if, if well, that, that sounds uh, that sounds great. Actually, and we're we're all connected with our uh, uh, you know state biologists uh, yeah. and everything, so we can do a. Uh, we, I'd, I'd love to put something like that together. I think we uh, are y'all. I didn't ask guys. Are y'all? Um, What's your, what's your, are y'all wildlifers, forestry? What do y'all, what do y'all primarily do? Uh, we're, we're all three just uh, general ag and natural resources. So okay. Okay. from beekeeping to gardening to, cool. uh, to forestry. Uh, so, yeah. You know, we well, well, the workshop, you know, I think beef cattlemen, forest land, you know, the timber growers, uh, we could throw a wide cast net. I think uh, y'all know this, y'all don't. But I think you would be pleased with the number of people we probably could bring to an actual event, uh, particularly hosted on a, on a real cool, you know, real good property. Uh, you know, something so, I was going to throw in about what is unique about where we are is that we've got elk and, and black bear as well. There you go. There and you go. That would have to add something to that lease talk. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't even do that because uh, y'all would know more about it. But um, I think your landowners would be of interest to that. And and really, uh, y'all's area of the world some of the prettiest prettiest land in the nation. So, um, and you're not that far as a crow flies from some of the population centers where people are wanting to. You know, we're pretty rural in Mississippi. We don't have a lot of. You know, it's a good thing, I guess. We don't have a lot of urban draw. But I'm just seeing the numbers continue to go up. Y'all are even, I think, even better positioned to, to uh, landowners are to take advantage of some of this. Bill's even got the woolly booger in his county. So uh, that's a, a Sasquatch knockoff. So, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, and I forgot to say, Bill Monroe was from Kentucky. We played bluegrass music. See, I, now I'm remembering all this uh -huh. stuff. Kenny He's Baker right. that played with Bill Monroe is from my town. How about that? I actually know his son. He's he's a oh, hunting wow. buddy of my uncle's. I mean, Bill Monroe, I mean, you're right next to Jesus when you're talking about that. <laughs> you know? Now, now Ralph Stanley, Ralph Stanley is from very close to this area. In fact, oh, my, love my, my, wife, my, my wife does taxes for Ralph, Ralph Jr. So. Oh, how about that? What? How cool is that? Yeah. Well, Let's uh, let's let's pony up and get together on one of these in the future. Listen, I'm, I'm glad I've gotten to know you, and and again, I'm honored to 
that you asked me to do this. It's been, it's been fun for me. So. Well, great. Thank you, yeah, thank, thank you for, for doing that for us. And if y'all have any of your land, I don't know how many you end up having, but if you have any circle back to you, if you need to put them in touch with me, don't feel hesitant at all. You, you let them, and they might call me direct, but you, you send them to me if I can help them. Okay. Thanks.